So I got this question on Instagram the other day from a coach who's looking to get some answers when it comes to programming during competitive period. So it seems like this coach is working with either junior players or uh, perhaps some, some slightly older players. Essentially they play tournaments and then they have sometimes a longer period between events. So this happens quite a bit. I work with a lot of players, especially now on the remote side of things where they're on tour and they'll play maybe three weeks in a row. Obviously, it really depends on how deep a player goes into a, into a tournament. So if they lose early in qualifying, then they perhaps have six or seven days before the next match. If they get into the main draw or if they're already main draw players, then that's gonna differ. There's a few things I wanna talk about here. The first thing is if players haven't done any sort of physical training, uh, you know, beforehand, then it's gonna be really difficult to program something in season. So they have to have some sort of history, some sort of experience and background with different types of training modalities. So whether that's medicine ball throws, jumping variations, plyometrics, weight training, you know, speed and acceleration work. If we want to improve and develop athletic qualities or at very least maintain those qualities in season, then we're definitely going to have to have some periods of time where focusing on these qualities so that, you know, proper techniques and form is met. Uh, we've actually developed the adaptations. We've had some of these adaptations take place. So we're just not throwing a new type of stimulus towards players. So that's that's the first step. If that step is is there, then what we need to do next is see, you know, how many days do we have? Typically for me, like if there's, for example, in this case, the, the coach said, yeah, about five days. So in these types of settings, you know, the day after a match, unless the player is really, um, you know, extremely sore, they had a really tough match or a series of tough matches, I typically like to get them going with something. So different options. Sometimes if they're a bit sore, then it might just be a lighter type of session where we might just do some uh, different medicine ball exercises, whether that's uh, non-throwing ex exercises or catch and throw activities that are extensive, they're not, you know, maximal, perhaps some, you know, body weight exercises, things that are low stimulus but get different things moving, so different joints moving, we increase blood flow and circulation, and we slowly start ramping up the intensity from there. Other things that we could do if the player, you know, had a match but is in fairly good shape, they're not overly sore, maybe just a little bit. And this is what I prefer doing, is getting going with some sort of light, you know, higher stimulus, higher power output type of stuff, uh, but that is at really low cost. So things like a max effort med ball throw, things like, um, like different jumping variations, so whether that's a broad jump or a box jump, um, double leg, single leg. These are activities that um, won't really make the, the player sore, especially if they're used to it, but we can sort of reintroduce, you know, uh, more of that neural stimulus. I also, on these days, like to get a little bit of upper body work in for a couple of reasons. One is I find that players are uh, underdosing upper body strength training in tennis and I just think it's not only important for to maintain overhead strength, overhead mobility, but I do think that long term we need to slowly add in certain cases a little bit of bulk so sort of as some body armor for players. We might add, you know, in certain cases exercises that yes increase range of motion or restore some of that range that we might have lost because of um, a match. So in certain cases, that might be groin range of motion, that might be range at the hip or the knee. It really depends on the player and their needs. And then when it comes to midweek, if we have you know that five day period, what I like to do is, is add something that's a little bit higher stimulus that week. We're still on the theme of, we wanna make sure that we're training 
neurally because those are typically the qualities that degrade over the course of many weeks in a row and over the course of a longer season. Because tennis itself is you know, a repeat sprint sport, players are usually fine when it comes to a, the a conditioning standpoint. What we seem to lose is speed qualities, acceleration qualities, elasticity, strength and power. So these are the things that I'd like to include, you know, if we have that at least maybe four or five day window, um, then we'll get into that type of work. And, and that usually includes, you know, some form of sprinting, jumping in plyometrics, and then some sort of lower body uh, strength stimulus. We could add some accessory work in here as well, but it really depends also on the tennis practices during that week. Um, in general though, during the entire time here, we're looking at uh, low sort of volumes. That might mean low number of sets, a low, lower number of rep ranges. We don't want to take a lot of these sets to failure. We don't want um, to harbor any type of fatigue it's really that minimal effective dose uh, concept that we're, we're looking to implement with players. Um, that's it for today. I'll post some other videos on what we do so one or two days leading up to a match you know, during competitive blocks and some other videos as well on, on various topics. So stay tuned for that. Please like if you enjoyed this video and share with your tennis friends.